Hello, it's Scott Manley here with another part of my career mode tutorial slash playthrough slash whatever. Look, we are flying our space plane, which we have taken to space. We have used it to launch a satellite, which recovered a highly valuable piece of space debris or space junk. Now we're going to try and bring it back to Kerbin. We've already mapped out or we've already added flags here, which will be... Oh, wait a second. Why is that not showing? That's a very odd behavior. Oh, apparently you have to have the nav ball showing. Okay, so anyway, yeah, we're going to set these as targets just so that we can use those uh, to guide us to the runway. We don't actually need to land it on the runway, but since landing it away from the runway gets us back less money, we want to do it as close as possible and ideally on the runway. Of course, to bring ourselves back, we want to fire our engines retrograde and slow the orbit down, and this that will uh, drop our periaps on the opposite side of the planet to uh, well over the target. So this is why I'm waiting until I was on the opposite side of the planet from the space center. So we want to bring the orbit down to about 40 or 35. Oh, wait! Oh! 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 Crank! I pushed the wrong buttons there. I went and fat fingered the the. <laughs> Z key. So my orbit is going to be a little steep, so I'm going to actually turn the whole thing around and fix that. That was a really, really stupid thing on my part. If we came in that low, we would almost certainly come up short and have to use the engines to fly the rest of the distance. Not saying that we're not going to have to do that, but you want to use the least amount of engines possible. Okay, 38. 38 should get us roughly in the ballpark of our target. So I'm just time accelerating till we come around the other side of the planet. And yeah, got to make sure that we're not losing uh, power here because, you know, we're going to need a bit of electrical power for descent. Once we hit the atmosphere, the atmosphere should, in theory, turn us nose forward because we have kept all that fuel in that forward fuel tank. That is the safe place to leave it in terms of stability. If you move it further back, you may get better maneuverability. And... Uh, I, I can't actually tell you what the best place to have that fuel is because I haven't really spent enough time with this aircraft at this time. So I'm playing it safe for now. And now, of course, we've entered the atmosphere. We're only getting four times time acceleration. I'm just letting the computer kind of keep this thing point in the correct direction. All it's going to do is adjust yaw and pitch to keep it on the, uh, on the prograde vector. It's not going to just roll. And this thing is... Apparently rolling all on its own. I don't think I'm doing anything here. It just tends to want to roll over one way. How strange. Maybe it's because... No, no, I guess I do have something assigned to roll vectors. I don't know what's going on there. Okay, so... I'm going to start moving it out of uh, prograde following mode and we're going to start lifting the nose up just a little. And what that will do is it'll push our periaps around the planet. So I turn stability assist onto plain old point me in one direction and just nose up a little here. There we go. See, I'm not even needing to do that. The nose will actually naturally rise as the planet turns beneath us. So now because the nose is coming up, that's actually... Uh, changing the shape of my orbit and my point of closest approach is now moving around away from me because of course I'm trying to lift the nose up and that's lifting my uh, alt my you know rate of descent it's reducing my rate of descent which is now getting on for like 10 meters per second so I've really managed to slow my rate of descent this is the thing with the space planes they uh, don't have great heat shielding or anything like the capsules. The capsules have these heat shielding that lets them just kind of drop through the atmosphere like a rock. The space planes, you have to kind of fly them through the outer edges of the atmosphere. If they drop too low, then they will suffer a whole lot of heating. If they, uh, and, and then, of course, you'll be in serious trouble. But you can maintain this high altitude. The other side of this is that you are trying to slow down near your target. So if you're too high, then you will slip through the atmosphere far too swiftly and gracefully and will probably overshoot significantly. So at some point, I'm going to start making hard turns, right? Now, I'm by lifting the nose up, I'm actually putting a lot more force on the aircraft. You can see that my G-force meter is rising. That's because it is pushing my aircraft up. But I can also point the nose down here 
and that will cause my nose to my uh, descent rate to go down and that will also apply g forces to my uh, aircraft if i'm just pointing exactly along the orbit then i will be slipping through the air effortlessly and not stopping now i can see the continent that i want to land on in sight i need to start thinking about slowing down so the whole pointing the nose down thing, that's not what the space shuttle would ever do because you know what? Those guys figured out the descent trajectory way beforehand. They had big computers. I am, of course, mostly eyeballing this and guessing. So by pointing the nose down, I ensured that I dropped into thicker atmosphere, right? Or rather was pushed down into thicker atmosphere. I'm going to turn off those temperature gauges because I don't want the memory leak to hit me. So at this point, we're definitely falling down steep, and I'm I'm going to try and, again, hold the nose up high to slow my descent so I don't go straight down. But I suspect that at some point I'm going to have to start turning a lot harder here. Our pitch is up pretty high, actually. We're slowing down at about 1G, 1,700 meters per second. I think, I think we might actually overshoot this, but that's fine here. So just keeping the descent going. There, one. You see, the higher your the higher your angle of displacement from the velocity vector, the higher you will, the faster you will decelerate. So now another trick you can do is you can turn, and that basically means that what you're doing is you're pushing the you're increasing the angle of attack, and therefore the amount of deceleration, but you're not adjusting the aircraft's natural tendency to go up or down, right? So if you don't want to slow your descent or accelerate your descent, you can turn hard like this. Space Shuttle does in fact do this, or it did in fact do this. It would do big S turns to, to bleed off speed. And I haven't bled off enough speed, so I am flying way high over this thing. At this point, our speed is about 1300. We really could get a little lower in the atmosphere. So I'm just going to be turning here. Come on, look. Hello. I'm just actually, what I'm really doing is a pilot maneuver where I'm rolling so I can look out my side window and check to see that the, the runway is clear for landing because, of course, uh, obviously air traffic control is on holiday and I'm having to figure out my own descent here. So there, yeah, we're down below, but we're down below Mach three now, or roughly Mach three. We're we're just crossing that, and I'm going to turn one more time the other way, and this is going to be the turn that brings us all the way around. Look at those G forces building up. Uh, if I was really in an experimental mood, I would pump the fuel further back and therefore perhaps get more more control here. But I'm going to play it safe, because going into some sort of high angle spin uh, or, you know, yaw at this altitude and speed could be fatal. It did actually happen to an SR-71 Blackbird where one of the engines had a, a stall or, a, I mean, I think it was a turbine or intake stall or something like that. Point was, the whole aircraft yawed very sharply at Mach 3, broke up, and the pilot and co-pilot essentially were flung free. Uh, unfortunately, the co-pilot died, but the pilot did survive, essentially ejecting at Mach 3. Now, I think I'm going to unhook these so I can start burning fuel from them. I have plenty of fuel elsewhere, but I think uh, this will be good. So I've obviously uh, enabled the new engine, or enabled the jet engines again. Of course, I had to turn out the lights and abort the spacecraft again to toggle these things back on. But now we're subsonic, we can turn this whole thing around. Uh, at this altitude, just so you're, just so you know, 12,000 meters, that's higher than most jet airliners are flying. If you think about it, 10,000 meters is about 33,000 feet. And so 12,000 is, is above most jet airliners. But now we've def we're falling down below that still. We're descending faster than any jet airliner would do in normal operation. Okay, so now we're going to use the nav ball to line up for the runway. Now, the runway is on the 270 vector. The pink marker is the head of the runway, so I need that pink marker to be on the 270 line. So I'm going to displace it all, all the way over to 275 in this, or 225, sorry. 
And as I fly forwards, that pink marker will kind of move away from where my nose is pointing, right? Simply because I'm getting closer to it. So essentially, I think about it again, it's like you're pushing this marker towards the direction you want it. And in this case, it's pushing towards the, the 217. When those are lined up, we will be at a position where we can actually turn and head towards the runway and hopefully uh, be good. Now, I think for stability, I'm going to actually start pumping some of this oxidizer back just to see. It doesn't really matter. I'm just going to use the oxidizer. It doesn't actually have any use for us right now except as ballast. I think this might just give me a little more control by, by pushing the, the weight of the aircraft back. But I don't know. I'll find out once I get closer to the runway. Okay. So you can see how that pink marker has in fact moved in the direction we want, so I'm just going to keep doing it. Now the other thing I'm doing is I want my velocity vector to be deflected away from the horizon at roughly the same amount as that the, the pink navigation marker, right? What that means is I'm descending roughly uh, towards the, the runway essentially, so the idea is that I will reach zero meters, I will reach sea level when I reach the runway, which is a good sign. If you're too high or too low, that that will be uh, that could be problematic, let's say. Assuming you have enough spare power, being too low is, is okay, you can correct for that. But being too high can mean a hard job getting rid of excess speed. So yeah, just keeping these at the same level. Now, important when you're doing this is to make sure that your velocity is surface mode, right? Because when you have an object targeted, it will sometimes switch to target mode, which will actually be the mode, for some reason in Kerbal Space Program, that is always the velocity minus the rotation of the planet. Basically, you have to account for the rotation of the planet and target mode will not do that. So you will think you're moving 175 meters per second faster than you are, or worse, 175 meters per second slower than you actually are. So make sure you are in target mode. You can, if you're, seriously, if you're heading into the runway going eastwards, you can find yourself stalling because you think you're moving at 200 meters per second when in fact you're moving at 25. Whereas in this direction, it it's less of a problem, but it does mean that your velocity vector is not reflecting your actual velocity vector. So now we're lined up, we, everything is lined up, we're aiming for the runway and you can start to go a little higher here because you remember the runway west marker is slightly ahead of the runway so it's okay, keep your nose just a little above that but that just gives us the idea that we're going in the right altitude keeping my throttle super low here, I'm not sure I even need throttle but I guess with this glide slope I'm just going to let the engines idle for a while um, because I want to be moving about a hundred or less before landing, because even then a hundred is pretty fast for a, a, a takeoff. Okay, here we go. Just, I'm just rolling to keep this lined up here. For some reason the yaw is not giving me the amount of power I would need. Okay. So now, yeah, definitely starting to eyeball this here. If you like, you can also target the runway east marker, and that will then give you another target to aim for once you've passed over the runway west marker, but at this point I think you're just eyeballing it most of the way. Okay, so starting my flare here to kind of slow down, brought the engines back up just a touch because having some speed is better than nothing. I'm going to target that marker. And then we want to we want to pull up just as we start to get low here. Oh, there, there, that's it. It's not the best landing I've ever done here. I think because the all that uh, mass is far forward. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I think because the mass was so far forward, it meant the the thing had a lot of inertia. That might be what I'm experiencing, or it could just be that it's a terrible design. But it did get back on the surface, and it got back on the runway. And, you know, if you can't make the runway, you can always go for the grass next to the runway. It's a little easier and it's only a 2% penalty in terms of cost. But yeah, we now have a reusable space vehicle and we have many, many missions that we can do with it. Which we will do in future episodes. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.